Good evening. Welcome to the Berkshire Health Program. My name is Dr. Mark Pettis. I'm your host. It has been almost impossible for the last several months to look at a news program on television or in the paper without reading about concerns of medication safety. And uh, in particular, there's been tremendous concern and interest around some of the newer pain medications or what we refer to as the anti-inflammatory medications. It's created a very confusing and uncertain uh, state for both uh, physicians and for people who require these medications to improve their quality of life. Uh, this evening, uh, to share some uh, insight and what I know will be very informative and in interesting information with you uh, is Dr. Ed Hornstein. Uh, Dr. Hornstein is the chief of the Division of Rheumatology uh, at Berkshire Medical Center and uh, has been practicing in this community for many years and is an, an expert on the treatment of inflammatory uh, pain conditions. And it's a great pleasure, Ed, to have you on the health program. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. The, um, just by way of, of general introduction, uh, Ed, you're a rheumatologist, and people often hear about rheumatology or rheumatism, but perhaps some of the viewers aren't entirely clear on what rheumatology is. So maybe that's a good place to start, and then we'll get into some of these more controversial issues. I, I, thank you for that. For that. Um, nice introduction. I, I think even talking about rheumatology is an interesting um, lead-in because my mom asked me what it meant to be a rheumatologist and I don't think my my kids exactly know what I do and what rheumatology is as well. Um, in my field of rheumatology we take care of arthritic conditions as well as conditions where the body is messing up and um, going after itself. So we, we talk about autoimmune disorders. And within um, that spectrum of disorders and diseases include um, conditions like systemic lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma. Most of those disorders, um, and there are many others, most of those disorders have um, prominent joint, muscle, bone um, issues with them or arthritic mm. issues with them. And by default, rheumatologists also become um, considered specialists, non-surgical specialists in musculoskeletal medicine and care of, of, uh, of non-inflammatory arthritic conditions as well. Mm. Um, probably the, the most common non-inflammatory arthritic condition that we take care of is a disorder called osteoarthritis. Um, people who are, are viewing this show We'll also hear osteoarthritis referred to by their physicians sometimes as um, degenerative arthritis or degenerative joint disease. Um, it's called wear and tear arthritis right. as well. Um, and, and it may almost be a misnomer. It's not truly an inflammatory process. So the term arthritis means joint inflammation. It's really a painful disorder caused by worn joints, worn cartilage, grinding mm. on worn cartilage. Um, and it's a very common disorder. It's a, it's a condition that can be provoked by prior injury. Uh, so, you know, we, we watch football and professional football on TV and we see these guys um, injuring their knees mm -hmm. and they're having their arthroscopic surgery and coming back. And in my head, I'm thinking, okay, I'll see you at yeah, age 40 right. with, your, um, with your knee problems. Right. Um, but it's also a normal or it can be a relatively normal facet of aging so that by the time you're my age um, uh, or you're in your 40s or in your 50s, more than 50% of us have some degree of wear and tear arthritis, osteoarthritis at some place in our mm -hmm. body. Um, and that osteoarthritic symptoms are probably some of the most common reasons that people come to the doctor's office. Yes. So. And, and Really, pain, which is the manifestation of so much of what you treat, is, is such a common experience for, for all of us, whether it's a, a joint or muscle or bone problem or whether it might be a headache. And I thought just to sort of set the context around some of the medications that we frequently recommend for pain, some of which are non-prescription, some of which are, are prescription would be a good way to lead into what have been many of the concerns raised over the last year or so with, with some of these prescription medications. Starting with the anti-inflammatory medicines, um, Ed, and, and particularly many of the over-the-counter 
names and brands that people will, will recognize. What are, what are some of the agents that you commonly recommend and that people will be familiar with in the treatment of pain? Well, you and I and most people um, that we deal with are well aware of a number of common analgesic medications and anti-inflammatory medications. And so um, when we treat these painful disorders, we have actually a relatively limited set of choices. Um, uh, once we start talking about medications, that is, I mean, outside of the recommendations for exercise, conditioning, moving toward ideal body weight, those right, things. Right. Um, and sort of uh, probably the mainstay pain relieving medication or analgesic is Tylenol um, or acetaminophen, non aspirin pain reliever. You'll see it framed in a variety of different ways when you're in the store. But, and that works very well for many people, um, and it's a relatively safe drug to use when you follow the manufacturer's recommendations. Mm. Um, once you move outside of the use of basic analgesics like uh, acetaminophen, Tylenol, you're moving into categories of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And you'll hear us just use the term anti-inflammatory medications or NSAIDs for yes. short yes. Um, as an abbreviation for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory mm. drug. And those medications have two primary modes of, of um, action. One is that they are effective at reducing inflammation, and inflammation in and of itself can provoke pain, cause pain. Um, and they're also analgesic medications, pain medications, separate from their impact on inflammation at all. Mm. Um, I would venture to say that most people reaching for non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, NSAIDs, are probably reaching for them for pain control, mm -hmm. whether it's for headache or, or um, menstrual cramps um, or um, to treat wear and tear arthritic symptoms. And so some of the ones, probably the classic um, non steroidal anti inflammatory drug is aspirin. Um, and aspirin has been around since the late, 19, late 1800s. Mm. So it's been around for over 100 mm. years. Um, aspirin has limitations, as most people who have taken aspirin know. Um, it is not always well tolerated from a gastrointestinal standpoint. Um, and some people are allergic to it um, with pretty profound allergies mm. or it provokes worsening of their asthma. So there was a search on looking for other medications that could provide analgesic um, benefits without the unwanted side effects of aspirin. And that led to the development of the classic non steroidal drugs that we know now. Um, the first one that came along was a drug called um, phenobutazone, which is no longer available, was pulled from the market many years ago. Um, and that was developed in the 1940s. Indocin was developed in the early 1960s. Um, and since that time, we've had a whole host of additional non steroidal medications. Um, virtually a litany of them. Um, the ones that are available over the counter, and this may not be all inclusive, but the most common are ibuprofen, mm -hmm. um, and that comes as Motrin or Motrin IB, Advil, um, or naproxen, which is another non steroidal right. anti inflammatory drug, comes as Aleve. Um, again, these are all available um, not as non name brand drugs as mm -hmm. well. Um, and there are several others, uh, Arutis, uh, similar drugs like that. Those drugs are available in pres prescription strength, and we have um, a variety of them. Um, Motrin, Naprosyn, Indocin, Telectin, Depro, Relefin, Lodine, Meclamin, Ansed, mm. Voltaren, Clinaril, Celebrex, Trilisate, Salsalate. Um, to name a few. Feldine, <laughs> uh, you know, Mobic. We yeah. can go, almost yeah. go on and on. I think right. there are more than 20 available yes. agents. Um, they are all effective analgesics. They help treat arthritic pain. They can treat pain elsewhere as well. Mm. Um, they all share similar potential side effects. And, um, and some of those side effects can be pretty prominent. And the primary side effects are gastrointestinal. I mean, there are others, but those are the ones that tend to limit the use of the medication um, more than anything else. Mm. And so there's been a desire by people who um, research the development of these medications to find ones that would work well, but not cause as much in the way of the unwanted side effects, particularly gastrointestinal. Right. And that led to the formation or, or the finding of these newer categories of anti-inflammatory medications 
um, that have hit the news recently, yes. like Viox, Bextra, Celebrex. Yes. So, um, and I think we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the controversy mm -hmm. around those, but um, the traditional non steroidal medications, while very helpful, are not benign. Mm -hmm. um, in, and um, as you heard me mention, gastrointestinal problems are the big issue. Right. Um, it's been estimated that over 100,000 hospitalizations each year are related directly to the side effects of non steroidal anti-inflammatory mm -hmm. anti drugs, NSAIDs. Mm -hmm. um, probably over 15,000 deaths a year just in arthritis patients are related to the use of those medications. Mm -hmm. And bad enough, uh, and we've always assumed in medicine that uh, you know, we would get fair warning about the unwanted side effects, particularly gastrointestinal, but um, research has shown that that's not the case. And probably over three quarters of significant gastrointestinal complications can develop with little or no symptoms present. Mm. So it's really a difficult issue in my field and, and um, for physicians across the board. Right. So you make some excellent points, Ed, and I just want to uh, reiterate those points. Uh, uh, one is that these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications have been around for many, many years, and there are many different brands out there. Right. We often refer to them as being within a family. Though their names and structure may be somewhat different, they have similar properties. And similar effects. And similar right. effects. Um, being non-prescription hardly means being without potential danger and side effects. So that so you, you bring out some statistics. Right. Absolutely. That, and I think people often don't realize that uh, uh, non-prescription doesn't always equal safe. Depending on the circumstances, uh, these can be very toxic medications. The newer drugs that have come out over the last year to two years, what we refer to as the, the COX-2, and you mentioned them by name, Celebrex, Viox, Bextra, were an attempt to develop medications that would have similar analgesic, anti-inflammatory properties, but fewer side effects, exactly. particularly the gastrointestinal side effects. And I'm sure you treating a lot of people with chronic pain, and I can certainly speak for myself as someone who does both primary care and subspecialty work, really welcomed this class of, of medications as something that we thought could serve our patients very well. So this we, we welcomed them with, with really open arms. Yeah. I mean, we were all looking forward to, to um, the potential for having a medication that would provide us a lot of benefit in trying to treat the conditions that we work to treat right with a lot less in the way of unwanted side effects. I mean, these medications, the literature told us, and it's, it's held pretty true, um, have a, an incidence of gastrointestinal side effects um, not much higher than that seen with placebo mm. and significantly better than seen with traditional um, non-COX. COX, by the way, is cyclooxygenase for those of you out there hearing us talk about that. And there are two um, two isoenzymes of COX, COX-1 and COX-2. And if we can inhibit COX-2, which is the inflammatory um, um, cyclooxygenase, we can accomplish the things that we want from, you know, in controlling inflammation. Traditional non steroidal medications in, um, um, inhibit both COX-1 and COX-2, and the newer ones just inhibited mm. COX-2. So we really were very um, enthusiastic about the potential benefits of these medications. Right. And we had patients who could not tolerate traditional anti-inflammatory medications of any form who did extremely well mm. with these new this new category of medications, individual agents within this mm. new category. Um, it, it, we also had the ability, for example, for the first time to use these medications in patients who were on blood thinners. Yes. Um, because these medications had no anti-platelet effect. They did not interfere with platelet function. And so, uh, platelets and, being, excuse me, platelets being critical in preventing excessive bleeding. Exactly right. right. So the platelets are the first thing to plug a hole, mm. and then the coagulation cascade is the, you know, forms that secondary clot. Mm. And Coumadin interferes with that secondary clot formation, but the platelets plug the hole initially. Mm. So if you were on blood thinners and you were also interfering with platelet function, you really had nothing 
around to plug mm -hmm. holes if they were to develop. Mm -hmm. um, so to have something that did not interfere with platelet function and also had a low incidence of gastrointestinal side effect and bleeding, for the first time, patients with arthritis or other painful conditions who were also on blood thinners could use these medications with some increased um, measure of safety compared to traditional an, um, anti-inflammatory meds, which we just completely avoided right. in those patients. Right. You know, so again, we were really very pleased to have them on board. Right. Now, I should comment that um, they were very strongly marketed. Um, they were really pushed. Um, you, many of you who are watching the show know that you've seen them advertised on, on television, you've seen them in, in the magazines, um, and uh, um, you'd think it was the next best thing to mm. you know, slice mm. bread. Um, so they were really, really heavily pushed. Those of you who um, were responsible for purchasing them out of pocket um, without health insurance coverage, for example, found that it didn't come without a price. And so a, a month-long um, uh, prescription for many of these were well over $100. Mm compared to a prescription for, for example, Motrin, which may have been 10 or 15. Right. So, um, and we're talking about drugs that had similar benefit. I should comment that these drugs were no better at controlling pain or inflammation in general than the older ones. Right. They were just thought to be generally safer. Mm -hmm. um, significantly more expensive, and were often used when there was not a contraindication there was no reason not to use a traditional anti-inflammatory medicine. So it became a pretty costly undertaking right. as well. So again, some very good points. Uh, no more effective in terms of reducing pain or inflammation, fewer side effects, which was really the, the advantage of the trump right. card, but at a significantly greater cost than what the traditional anti-inflammatories were. Um, I'm going to come back a little bit uh, later uh, around this whole notion of direct-to-consumer marketing, Ed, because okay. th this is a, a, an area that I think people often ask me about. Um, so I, I, if I don't bring it up again, remind me. Uh, but I want to just sort of uh, create the timeline or chronology uh, in recent, I guess over the last year or so, around some of the risks that began to surface. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Celebrex was the first of these new COX-2 anti-inflammatories to be approved by the FDA. Right. Celebrex and Vioxx was approved um, in, in um, very short order, right. and I think both of them were in 1999. Yes. Yeah, so, so they had right. been around for about four or five right. years, and then Bextra was the last to enter that, that family. So far. So far. There are more coming. Um, so if we turn the clock back about a year or so, perhaps a little bit more, we begin to see reports of people having cardiovascular or heart complications on these COX-2 inhibitors. And at the time, we're, we're talking about Vioxx, Celebrex, Bextra, though much of that initial concern was on Vioxx. And these are pretty serious concerns. These are people having heart attacks. These are people that are having a cardiac arrest uh, with or without known heart disease. And suddenly we have this rather shocking revelation that medications that we all felt great about because of their lower risks of side effects now not only have side effects, but you know, potentially life-threatening side effects. What, what was your response when you first heard some of these reports surface? Uh, just easy panic. Um, <laughs> the, the, actually, it was a little bit of framed disbelief. Mm -hmm. um, theoretically, from a scientific standpoint, I couldn't figure out what the mechanism was that might provoke it. And when the initial studies came out, um, it looked as if it may have been um, uh, just the way it was being looked at so that it appeared like there might be an increased cardiovascular risk and there may not really have been. So for example, there was concern that, um, that they were comparing uh, uh, patients, people who were taking these medications and um, 
against people who are taking other anti-inflammatory medications. And so that other anti-inflammatory medications, the traditional ones, have antiplatelet effects, aspirin-like antiplatelet mm -hmm. effects. And what we thought we were seeing initially was that we were comparing the lack of a drug with an antiplatelet effect versus the presence of a drug with an antiplatelet effect so that it wasn't an increased risk of cardiovascular um, side effect with the Celebrex or the Vioxx. Mm. It was the lack Just of an effect less protection. with right. less protection based against mm. um, people who were taking other anti-inflammatory mm. medicines that might offer some protection. Right. And that's sort of where it sat for a while. Mm. And um, the thing that really changed the whole view was um, these COX-2 enzymes are not just present in um, you know, areas of pain and inflammation around arthritic areas. They are also present in certain types of new growth or neoplasms, particularly colon polyps. And so these drugs were being studied in patients who had colon polyps to see if they reduce the incidence of colon polyps and to see if um, that would reduce the incidence of cancer. And what they found then was purely looking at these drugs mm. that there was a significant increased risk. It was a small risk, but it was a significantly increased risk for stroke or heart attack in patients who were taking these medications at high dose for a long period of time. Right. So for example, even with Vioxx, it didn't become apparent that there was any change in cardiovascular risk until patients had been on these medications for more than 18 months right. at full dose. Right. Um, and that was a shocker to all. Mm. Um, maybe to their credit, uh, but certainly to uh, the disruption of many clinical practices and to the confusion of many patients, um, Merck, who were the makers of Vioxx, elected to pull that drug from the market when, uh, when they started receiving that data. Right. Um, we didn't know if the same was going to hold true with the other COX-2 specific drugs, Celebrex and Bextra. And so there was an immediate sort of transition mm -hmm. because the, many of the patients who were on these medicines couldn't tolerate traditional anti-inflammatory medicines. And we were shifting them to Celebrex and Bextra off the Vioxx. Mm. So it was no more easy when similar information started coming out about um, um, these other agents and it looked to be a class effect rather than a drug effect. Right. Now there does seem to be variation between how potent of an effect, a cardiovascular effect, these medications uh, might have. And then on an even bigger scale in the same time frame, there have been studies that are worrisome in terms of traditional anti-inflammatory medications and their impact on cardiovascular health. So the FDA in its most recent pronouncement recommended that Baxter be withdrawn from the market. Now they did that in conflict with their advisory panel. Their advisory panel recommended that Baxter and Celebrex remain available to the consumer the patient at the discretion of the physician who would um, hopefully be balancing risks and benefits, mm. counseling the patient, counseling the person, and using these medications judiciously, avoiding using them in patients who might be at high risk for cardiovascular disease. We don't know where to go right now, frankly, in, in many ways. Um, with just like we shifted away from Vioxx and moved people to Bextra and Celebrex, with there being more concern about this category of medications being potentially problematic, there's been a shift away from those medications to traditional anti-inflammatory medicines. And there's emerging data that's worrisome in some ways about cardiovascular issues with traditional anti-inflammatory medicines. To the degree that when the FDA made the recommendation to remove Bextra from the market, it made a much broader recommendation as well. 
it made a recommendation that all non-steroidal medications, including the non-selective or the traditional anti-inflammatory medicines like, ibuprofen, like Motrin, Naproxen, right. Indocin, that they also be tabbed with what we call a black box warning um, outlining that there may be cardiovascular risks associated with the use of those medications and to avoid them in select groups right. of patients. Right. Um, so we are really at um, some loggerheads. We have patients who are hurting, who are coming to us and saying, doctor, you know, my knee doesn't allow me to do the things that I like to do day to day. Um, my neck, my low back, uh, my lifestyle is not what I want it to be. What can you do to help me? Mm. And our choices are relatively limited. Most of these patients are not candidates for surgical intervention. Um, and if acetaminophen, Tylenol, is not working adequately, we really have choices of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or narcotic analgesic medications, medicines like codeine, um, uh, hydrocodone, yeah. um, morphine. And as um, all of us know, those medications are fraught with potential um, unwanted complications, yes. not the least of which is physiologic dependency and in a small subset of patients, the potential to provoke uh, addiction. Mm. And with many side effects in addition to that. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the whole, I mean, it seems, Ed, that the whole uh, dimension of pain management has been thrown off balance by a lot of what we've been hearing about you know, over the last year or so. And, so, and, and it's confusing, even for physicians, to sort of um, really put this in some meaningful perspective, because I think it's fair to say that this is still very much evolving in its understanding, uh, and, and the jury's still out on how best to select these medications and who best to prescribe them to. It, it seems that, uh, and, and just I guess by way of current state of, of understanding, Celebrex right now is the only COX-2 newer anti-inflammatory that the FDA continues to approve utilization right. of. Right, allow, has allowed to remain on the market. Right. Though the reality again is, is that Vioxx was not removed from the market by the FDA. Right it was removed by the manufacturer. So I don't know what the technical issues right. there, but Celebrex is the only currently available um, COX-2 mm. specific right. non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Right. There are some others that have COX-2 selectivity, but they are not COX-2 right. specific. And we don't know whether that selectivity may have any role to play in cardiovascular risk. We don't even know what the cardiovascular risk is from. And there have been, um, the, we don't know if it's, it's increasing the risk of thrombosis clotting in the blood vessels, or if it may be a secondary risk um, issue, and for that reason share risk with other non medications, because all of these drugs, for example, can cause people to hold on to more salt and water and increase blood pressure. And if we increase blood pressure by you know, six or 10 points, we um, increase the risk of cardiovascular events, as right. we all know, as those of us who try to treat uh, patients with hypertension. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what the, um, the, the, you know, the medical term is the etiology. We don't know what is causing the increased cardiovascular right. risk of these medications, right. and whether it is specific to the COX-2 drugs or it's going to be an issue more related to salt and water retention, high blood pressure provocation, and right. it could be offset by the use of um, a more aggressive antihypertensive therapy. Right. We also don't know if it could be offset, for example, by the use of low-dose aspirin. Um, and so we have lots of questions that beg to be answered. Mm. Um, low-dose aspirin by the way, has been reported to be made less effective by the use of certain traditional non medications. And that information has come out within the last few years. Um, and we, again, we don't know what to make of it 
um, with certainty, but um, both ibuprofen and naproxen have been reported to inhibit the potential beneficial, cardiovascular beneficial effects of low-dose aspirin yeah. through unclear mechanisms. Right. Now, even from that standpoint, and this is the, the twisted um, path that we're finding ourselves on, the traditional non-steroidal medications in the past, including naproxen, naproxen, have been purported to be effective at helping prevent cardiovascular um, uh, or decreasing cardiovascular risk. So we really have conflicting information mm -hmm. about the use of many of these um, medications right now, and there's a lot more that needs to be done to sort it out. Mm -hmm. But choices are limited, and, and you, you spoke, I think, eloquently in saying we are continuing to sort out and figure out where we're going and how this is going. And some of my patients have heard me say, and I, I know it sounds a little bit uh, trite, but we've had aspirin around now for over a hundred years. We are still figuring out the good things and bad things that it does now, mm. over a hundred years mm. later. It shouldn't be a surprise to us that medications that have been out for six years, five years, ten years, fifteen years, we're still figuring out. Mm. Um, and, and the bottom line is we need to treat patients we need to alleviate pain and discomfort. We need to keep people functional and mobile, and we need to do it as safely as we can. And it's quite a task. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the responsibility of treating physicians um, who care about what they do to make themselves as aware of the medical literature as they can and, and arm their patients with information so the patients themselves, in concert with their docs, can make informed decisions. Mm -hmm. um, the best way to do that is to have more information. We all need more information right. regarding um, where we're going, you know, in this area. Well, it certainly uh, underscores the importance of collaborative decision making. Uh, I think people often assume, and certainly this whole, um, all of these controversies have awakened all of us, consumers of care, providers of care, to the inherent limitations in many of the systems that we put great faith and trust in, in helping us determine what's safe, what isn't safe, where are the risks, you know, wh where perhaps are the risks less significant. And um, all of it underscores the importance for any individual and their physician to really carefully examine risks and benefits at least as we currently understand them, for anything they're using, prescription, non-prescription. We talk about botanicals, supplements, natural is not safe. Um, we are a, we are a, uh, a pharmaceutical consuming uh, society. Yes, yeah, And yeah. Um, I think it was, um, I, I read a quote not too long ago, and, you, and you'd appreciate this, Ed. It was William Osler, it was 100 years ago. And Osler said that the one characteristic that best distinguished man from other animals was man's desire to take medication. Now, this was 100 years ago. Uh, so one, there are many messages here, but I think one message is that often there are non-pharmacologic options, and you touched on very briefly, you know, exercising, um, dieting, these are challenging, yet they can be enormously effective. Mm -hmm. um, but, but a lot of people I know are, are wondering, you know, how could this have happened? And um, I think it would help for people to appreciate that, that the FDA, it's sort of interesting when you look at the, the, the 10, 15 year recent history of the FDA. Uh, back in the early 90s, the FDA was, was scrutinized by the public, by industry, pharmaceutical industry, by uh, healthcare professionals because of often the long time it took to bring medications to the market. Mm -hmm. Medications that we thought could help people but were forced to go wait often many, many years through this vigorous testing process. When HIV came around, and the, just the horrors of, of AIDS and, and young people dying all over the world, 
there was this sort of social imperative to quickly bring effective drugs to the marketplace and to try to reduce these, these otherwise lengthy processes. And uh, Congress actually passed in 1992 legislation in collaboration with the pharmaceutical industry who, who paid the FDA to say, look, we'll pay you if you help us work on processes that can expedite this FDA approval process, which has literally been cut in half. And it did allow HIV medications. It has allowed certain uh, chemotherapeutic, chemotherapeutic you know, life-saving drugs. And I think that was the initial impetus in the early 90s, was to allow life-saving drugs to get to the public more quickly. So now we seem to be seeing 10, 12 years later, perhaps, some very significant consequences of the shift in, in thinking. Um, I don't think as important as Vioxx and Celebrex and Vextra are, they're not, we wouldn't put them in the same category as chemotherapy or, or AIDS treating drugs. And we know that the industry has significant influence on the approval process. So, the, so suddenly these conflict of interests begin to emerge, even though we, we appreciate medicines improve the quality of our life. But, but suddenly, all of the systems that we all put our trust in are now called into question. And that's a, that's a, that's a sobering reality. Well, of, uh, and and, it's, and it, 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 you couldn't say it any better. It's a sobering reality. And those of us who practice medicine on the street um, you know, have become, I think, healthy skeptics about new, mar new drugs, new um, pharmaceuticals uh, hitting the market. And you know, I and many of my um, colleagues will avoid the use of new medications for some sort of arbitrary time frame, a year or a couple of years, using other medications if possible, mm -hmm. unless absolutely pushed, because we've watched so many m medications hit the market, right. highly touted, and subsequently um, pulled from the market because of unanticipated or unexpected um, complications or side effects. And so most of us have become a little bit gun shy about new medications out there. Even in doing that, um, it, it's not helped us mm. many times. And mm. for example, you know, these medications have been around um, since 1999. Here we are in 2005. So even if we waited diligently a year or a couple of years before reaching for these, mm. these are just sort of being, um, you know, these specific issues with the drugs we're talking about are have been found in the um, last year or so. Right. Um, you asked me to remind you about the direct marketing right. to the consumer. And um, previously, pharmaceutical companies would um, really market primarily to physicians. And they did it very effectively. And those of us who are, are physicians are well aware of um, how we are um, uh, candidates to be wined and dined, taken out to dinner, um, trinkets and trivia, and um, um, lots of ways that products are sold. Uh, but they found an even more effective way of moving their products, mm. and that is direct marketing to the consumer, so that the consumer, the patient who sees these ads on TV touting Celebrex or Vioxx as being the drug to mm. treat their arthritis, come into their physicians and ask, why aren't you giving me this medication, right. which is so good? Right. You obviously don't care for me the way you need to care for me. You'd be giving me this drug that yes. I saw on TV that's so good. And, um, and we've seen many, many patients, many, many people started on these medications without good rationale mm. or justification, mm. except that it was um, uh, maybe a customer service mm. issue because of direct marketing. Right. And I, I think it's created in some ways and even while there's certainly advantages and we want our patients talking to us mm -hmm. and asking us questions about medications, um, in some ways it's disadvantageous and potentially dangerous mm -hmm. because um, uh, we are no longer relying solely on our good sense and clinical expertise potentially. Right. Um, hopefully that's not the truth commonly. Right. But um, So the the... The world of medicine and marketing of pharmaceuticals, the approval process of mm. pharma pharmaceuticals, has changed dramatically in the time that you and I have been doctors. Right. 
Um, and and uh, we're trying to change with it. Yeah. Make sure that, making sure that we treat patients, people, effectively, but safely. Mm. And, um, and I would continue to move back to the point of, as physicians, especially in my field, I don't do surgery for a living. I treat patients with, um, with medications, um, recommendations for lifestyle modification and the like, but you know, my ballywick is finding the right thing to treat somebody in the right way. It is incumbent upon me to know the medications I use. What are the benefits? What are the risks? What are the common and uncommon side effects? Right. And I would task every physician out there um, who, who is a cognitive physician, a physician doing internal medicine, family practice, um, who's, who's, who are responsible for making medication recommendations, that it is their responsibility to understand to the best of their ability the potential mm -hmm. pros and cons of any medication that they are recommending to uh, an individual, a patient. Right. Those are such great points, Ed. You know, the direct-to-marketing uh, advertisement is really phenomenal uh, in, in how it's evolved over the last few years. And it's a huge market. When you look at the healthcare expenditures, which are phenomenal, $1.8 trillion in 2004, pharmaceuticals are a significant and growing piece of that large pie. And we know that... Uh, Pharmaceutical companies now often spend more on marketing and advertisement than they do on research and development. And there's a reason for that. It, it works. It pays more. <laughs> it works. <laughs> uh, but as physicians, we, we do, even with our best intentions, are, uh, can be vulnerable to the influence of that marketing, as you pointed out. And certainly the consumers are going to see people riding their bikes and running on the beach and just looking like they're, they've just never been better uh, and hard not to be influenced uh, by that kind of, of advertisement. It, it's also become clear, and I think it'll help the viewers to appreciate that while the FDA historically has done a, a pretty vigorous job, more than any other regulatory agency on the planet, in examining safety prior to approval of these medications, once medications are approved, Safety, danger issues are really left to voluntary reporting systems. Pharmaceutical industries who certainly have no vested interest in bringing to the FDA's attention side effects that they're hearing about, particularly when they're, these medicines can be making billions for them. Physicians and the mechanisms that physicians confront to report to the FDA safety issues are often time consuming, onerous. So we really have a voluntary system of post approval reporting, which clearly has to change. And the FDA I know is in the process of changing that. But that's well and a real you know, concern. And you know as well as I do that the FDA has a tremendous tasking at hand. And you know one of the things that would um, be mandatory is if we are going to ask them to do more, they need to be better funded. I mean, it really is a manpower and funding issue. They are, they are sort of overworked, underfunded, and understaffed for the responsibilities they have. Mm -hmm. And none of this comes free. Right. So I, I think if, if um, the taxpayer, the consumer, the patient out there thinks that this has to be done differently, and this includes us, I, I, I think it's important to comment, Mark, that you and I are not just providers of health care. We're consumers. We consume health care as well. We are patients, and so are our families. And so we have a vested interest in making sure that the health um, care delivered in our community, not just Berkshire County, um, um, but across the board, is delivered fairly, um, um, efficiently, uh, safely, and it's the best it can be. And so we need to raise our voices and make sure that there's appropriate funding for post-marketing surveillance of, of uh, medications, drugs, after they um, hit the market, and make sure that these things are looked at again and again. These cardiovascular risks of, of Celebrex, um, or, you know, of Vioxx, Bextra, they were picked up as an 
an, almost an incidental mm -hmm. finding with studies designed to look at another potential right. use of the right. medication. So they were found by accident. Right. Um, and unfortunately, that happens all too frequently, mm -hmm. and it just makes you wonder which things aren't being found exactly. out, um, reported on, and attended to. Exactly, and that's where a lot of the emphasis is now as I uh, try to understand some of the strategies of the FDA to modify this regulatory and post-approval um, process of safety. Bextra is a, a, an example of... Um, as you pointed out, the cardiovascular risks were picked up as Bextra was being used to study something totally unrelated after 18 months of use. Some of these side effects began to appear. Bextra took 18 months for the approval process, so no one that the FDA looked at had been on Bextra at a period of time where these side effects would have been recognized during right. the approval process. Right. So. Um, I know that the FDA is beginning to examine um, studies that would continue to follow many of these medications post-approval because, as you point out, if I'm 70 years old and I have high blood pressure and I have diabetes and high cholesterol, and many people that age do, and I'm taking Motrin periodically for pain and I have a heart problem, I'm not going to be questioning whether Motrin is the cause of that heart problem. I'm going to be inclined to say, well, they have a history of diabetes and high blood pressure. That's why they had a heart problem. So the notion that many of the medications that have been around for a long time are causing problems that we may not be attuned to can't be picked up unless you're really looking at it in a specific way. And that's in a formalized fashion. Yeah. Just as a, a, a brief aside, with Bextra, which was the most recent you know, created the most recent flurry of activity. The decision to pull it from the market was not based on cardiovascular risk primarily. It was based on the rare incidence of a horrific rash, mm -hmm. which, you know, we, we call Stevens-Johnson syndrome, um, which is a horrible, horrible rash, almost equivalent to a severe burn. Um, and that was the primary motivator to pull Baxter, not the cardiovascular right. issues. The cardiovascular issues were identified. Right. Um, now, you could justifiably ask, are there other medications out in the marketplace that are known to be associated with Stevens-Johnson syndrome? And you and I know that there are a number, right. including certain antibiotics and, and the like. So I, I don't even still understand the full rationale and the approach that the FDA used in making the decision that they made. Right. And, and, um, and I should tell you that my professional organization, which is the American College of Rheumatology, strongly disagreed with the FDA's uh, move to take mm. this um, medication off the market. They also disagreed with um, the recommendation for black box warnings broadly for non-steroidal medications without additional information being gathered. Um, and they were um, really not pleased with how they left physicians and patients in a state of confusion. Mm. So. Um, Things just need to be done better, right. uh, and and um, uh, and hopefully they will be, um, yeah, with I, with uh, us all demanding it. I think we're going to see a lot of change uh, over the next few years, and and hopefully people will appreciate the importance of their own self advocacy and empowerment as they contemplate taking medication. So uh, understanding more, whether that information is coming from a physician or healthcare professional or what you, what you uh, find yourself over the internet, through printed materials, very important to understand what your individual risks and, and benefits might be so that you can bring that into this, into this analysis. It's very important. Um, you, you cannot emphasize what you just said enough. A, a, um, a, dis a decision making process where you need to be an advocate for your own health care in concert with your physician is going to lead to the best of outcomes mm. and and I can't tell you how many patients have said to me and I know your experience is the same my doctor just said take this and wouldn't talk to me about it or wouldn't talk to me about the potential effects or side effects in my advice <laughs> to anybody who finds their physician unwilling to talk to them about the use of a medication 
the potential risks and the potential side effects is to run. Find another doctor. You need to work as a team when you're providing health care, mm -hmm. meaning that, uh, uh, the team being the patient and the doctor. And, and if you're not being attended to and you're not being listened to, you are not going to have the best outcome available. And, and I just think you have to tuck that away. Yeah, it, more important now than ever. Uh, in, in the last five minutes, and uh, th this hour has gone by so quickly, Ed. Uh, again, I'm with uh, Dr. Ed Hornstein, who's the Division Chief of Rheumatology at the Berkshire Medical Center. So to, to pull all this sort of complicated information together, Ed, um, if I'm an individual who, who confronts chronic pain, uh, and let's say I have this osteo or degenerative wear and tear arthritis. What, what, what's the best advice you could give me or anyone who's confronting the need for chronic pain? Well, um, in, there's a stepwise approach to the treatment of something like osteoarthritis. And so, um, again, I think the safest and easiest intervention, and, and I'm going to talk about pharmaceutical mm -hmm. interventions because the understanding is going to be that all of these are going to be in the context of range of motion, conditioning exercise, a work right. toward ideal body right. weight, those types of things. Um, that can't be overstated, so I, yes. I, I do need to get yes. back to that. Absolutely. Um, they're, they're, um, uh, so the use of acetaminophen is effective for many. Um, probably now a decade ago, New England Journal of Medicine compared acetaminophen to the use of ibuprofen in the treatment of osteoarthritic pain. They found them to be very similar. So again, from a safety standpoint, acetaminophen, good choice. If it's not adequate, you need something more, it, would, it is not unreasonable to reach for a non-steroidal medication. I think you use the lowest dose um, possible to control the symptoms. And one of the things that I think is important to recognize, for example, we've talked about over-the-counter non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. They are the same medication available as prescription drugs, and the only difference is the total dose. So, for example, if I prescribe naproxen to you, you're going to get a prescription for a 375 or a 500 milligram mm -hmm. tablet. If you're going to buy naproxen over the counter, it's 220 milligrams. You needless to say can make that 440 milligrams by taking two. But so use the lowest effective dose. The these risk issues with these drugs, whether it's gastrointestinal or cardiovascular, seem to be dose and duration related. Mm. So the longer you use it, the more risk may develop. The higher the dose you use, the more the risk may be. Mm -hmm. So judicious use for as brief a period of time or used as needed rather than it being a regular medication right. might be a very reasonable approach. Right. Using other modalities, um, including, for example, in large joints, local injection um, with cortisone, topical creams, um, and even we talked and we mentioned in passing um, some um, non-traditional therapies glucosamine and chondroitin right. sulfate, which have been shown to be um, effective for the majority of people who use them and have a very low incidence of unwanted yes. side effect. Um, and may, unlike non-steroidal medications, actually work to prevent progressive cartilage loss, um, would also be a reasonable choice. Right. I am still using non-steroidal medications regularly, both in my <coughs> osteoarthritic patients and in my patients with inflammatory arthritis. We use what we have to use, couching that use with an understanding of potential risk and working to offset the risk the best you can. If you have cardiovascular risk, make sure blood pressure is controlled. Make sure lipids, cholesterol is where mm -hmm. it, it ought to be. If you're a smoker, any of you out there who are smokers, stop, please, stop, okay? Um, um, we need to control the cardiovascular risk factors mm -hmm. that we can control. Mm -hmm. We can't control age, we can't control gender, sex, right. we can't control family history, right. but we can control those other things. So important, um, sorry to interrupt no, this no, no. excellent yep. flow, but so. that's important in that many of these risks that you, you've heard about are cardiovascular risks. And some people who other, are otherwise healthy, do not have high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, and non-smokers probably have, at least as far as we understand now, a very, very low risk. Very low risk. But if you have a higher risk, if you are a smoker, if you are a diabetic, very important, as it would be anyway under any circumstance, right. to have all of those risk factors controlled. And we've had many shows where 
we've emphasized the importance of that. Even more important if you're taking some of these anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. um, people, um, in the last minute or two, Ed, you know, we talked about the gastrointestinal side effects. Um, with a lot of the, um, if a person does need more regular use of these medications, they've exhausted all other options, mm -hmm. and this, and that risk-benefit analysis appears to be the best option. Do you ever recommend an anti-ulcer medication or something that will help offset those side effects? I th thank you. That's a very good question. You led me right into mm -hmm. it. Um, the traditional non medications with their primary unwanted side effects being gastrointestinal, those gastrointestinal risks can be reduced significantly. Again, limiting dose, using as needed, lowest possible dose. Um, but certain anti-ulcer medications, acid-lowering medications, can significantly reduce risk as well. Things like um, protonics, Pravacid, Pepsid, right. um, some of the medications that people uh, are well aware of, yes. Prilosec, the yes. little purple pill, yes. or whatever, the Nexium. Nexium, right. Um, so those medications, uh, see, I'm subject to um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the impact of, the yes, impact of advertising. Yeah, right. um, so yes, we can offset cardio, we can offset gastrointestinal risk and, um, and often are effectively able to use these medications when combined with um, a medication aimed at preventing stomach problems. Great, great advice. Uh, well, I hope you have found this uh, episode of the Berkshire Health Program informative and interesting. I want to thank Ed Hornstein, uh, again, Division Chief of Rheumatology at Berkshire Medical Center. Never take for granted the importance that your role plays in your, in your health journey, and thank you for watching.